Today we are joined by an amazing guest with an amazing career. His name is Fred Burton. He's really a hero. I mean, he has been all over the world and has walked through, sadly, a big chunk of terrorism in the Middle East that we've suffered under. Now, we'll start on a lighter note. How are you doing today, Fred? I'm doing just fine, Eric. I, I appreciate that introduction, by, but no stretch of the imagination uh, should anybody consider me a hero. I think anyone who is doing their best to save lives is a hero, be it a firefighter, a soldier, or somebody who's trying to stop terror. Sorry, I'm going to pin the label on you. Just wear it. Well, thank you. You're very kind to say that. <laughs> and I'm going to start off with that. You started your book, Ghost, which I've been reading, with a list. And it's a lot of years later since you started your list. Are there still a lot of names on the list, or has the list been whittled down a bit? It has been whittled down a bit. Uh, I've managed to work my way through quite a few since we uh, uh, put the list together. And uh, from my perspective, you know, there, there's still a lot of loose ends, Eric, sure. that, that kind of drive me, uh, especially uh, the older I get. Mm -hmm. uh, recognizing that the hourglass of time has kind of shifted and that uh, that's one of my motivations for, you know, hearkening back to the days of the 70s and 80s with my stories, just because um, I feel that there's a lot of loose ends that I kind of left hanging in, sure. in my old case files. Is there also a fear, and I'm going to bring up a previous guest who is going to seem unusual to you, but Jack Barsky was a KGB agent who lived undercover in the United States. He is now an American citizen and very patriotic. He loves the country, but he fears as I do, he's in his seventies and people don't remember the Soviet union. We're starting to age out. Uh, do you also fear that maybe some people are starting to age out and we're just tired? We're just tired of hearing about it here and maybe neglecting some of those loose ends you're speaking of? I think that that's a very good point that uh, Jack and you have made. I think if you look at uh, my time frame when I was a special agent, uh, that was a long time ago now. And the world has changed, and if you put in cons if you put it in perspective of it's been a long time since 9/11. Adults. And then there are adults. Right, and and then you look at our almost 20 years of war in Iraq and Afghanistan, but what people don't realize is that, as a student of history, and I'm always reading, that. Um, you really do need to understand how we got here and to understand the events of 9-11 uh, or to understand Jack's pers perspective of the Cold War and the KGB. Sure. Uh, you really do have to wind back the clock and look at some of these events that began in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. And I don't know, I, I think it was Joe Rogan who originally said it. I thought he had a great analogy. He, he called the Middle East the townies of the world. And what he meant by that is, I don't know if you're familiar with Boston, but they have people who never leave, and they're kind of like the local rabble-rousers. They never change. They hold grudges. They've got everything going for time, and they just fight, and they never get along. His thought is that the Middle East, cradle of civilization, they just never left. And all their old grudges and everything else, they've never moved on from them. Would that be a fair analogy? I look at it this way. I tell uh, junior analysts or when I'm talking to students that if you want a job for life, you should try to be a Middle Eastern intelligence analyst because you're always going to be employed with the Israeli-Palestinian issue, with the events that's unfolding uh, in the Middle East. And there are some places that are impossible to fix because of the geopolitics of the world. 
So it's one of those kinds of things that you could do, Eric, that is job security forever if you want to focus on Middle Eastern terrorism, violence, the geopolitics of the region. Well, and isn't that the problem, though? I mean, they think in terms of generations and lifetimes. They're not... They're not short-term thinkers. They don't worry about two years ahead. They actually worry about their kids bombing us or their grandkids bombing us or or whatever. And I, I feel like they're much more patient than we are. And I think you brought up an example of the book that an operation was planned in 1993 and carried out in 2008. Yeah, and they are in many ways looking at the American footprint and they understand that we are an impatient kind of people mm -hmm. and that we are very much driven by uh, election cycles, not to mention the current violence that's taking place inside our great nation. But they do see that every four years, maybe eight years, we are going to get a new National Security Council, a new administration that's going to shift gears and go in different directions and that's the way that it's always been. So when you look at their perception of events, they really are in for the long game. And most of us in this country uh, aren't like that. You look at American corporations, they're very much quarter driven. You look at the day-to-day -day lives of most of us, we're worried about how to stay healthy in COVID and the upcoming presidential election. We're not thinking about a generation ahead we're hoping to survive, we're hoping to lead a good life and be prosperous, and we're hoping our kids will have a better life than we did. That was a great analogy you brought up the corporations. I forgot the number, but I think it's 65% of the um, S&P 500 in 2000 are gone. Yeah, I'm not surprised with that number, but uh, I just know from interaction with corporations that uh, they do care to some degree about forecasting, but for the most part, they're very much driven by this quarter. Right. And maybe they're looking at the next quarter. So that's one of the problems when you start trying to deal with this kind of issue, that everybody that you're dealing with in the Middle East uh, are looking at this from the perspective of, well, is the president going to be reelected or is there going to be a change of administrations? If so, who is going to be the new secretary of state? Which direction will the National Security Council go? What will be the priority at that moment in time? I just know when I was an agent that terrorism was not a priority. Right. That we just did not have the resources to deal with the problem. And that centers on the fact that the entire intelligence community in those days, Eric, were driven by the Cold War. It was sure. the U.S. versus the Soviet Union. China and Cuba to a much lesser degree. I, and I hate to say it as, as some of this due to prejudice, I mean, a lot of this is in the quote, third world, and who cares about them anyway? And I look at like Magnia, who you're talking about, and he's obviously, was obviously a ruthless, horrible killer, so much blood on his hands. However, he never pushed it enough to have a 9-11 on us. He never, you know, he hit things that, while they would hurt us, we would kind of, paper over it or get over it? Well, I look at uh, Imad Mugnia as uh, a, a a master terrorist, and they're few and far between, Eric. Mm -hmm. you, you would have to go back to, uh, you know, an individual like Ali Hassan Salome, the Red Prince of the Black September organization. Mm -hmm. And then you can look at an Imad Mugnia who had so much American and Israeli blood on his hands. Uh, in fact, you know, before 9-11, Magnia had more U.S. and Israeli blood on his hands than any other terrorist in the history of mankind. And so he was being utilized as a tool of foreign policy for the Iranians. And you see, this is where the Iranians and the Middle East is such a quagmire, meaning they knew that if they could utilize an individual like Magnia as an agent of foreign policy, they could drive the Americans out of Lebanon. They could disrupt U.S. global operations with 
very tactical terrorist attacks that for the most part, when people turned on their TV or read about it in the Washington Post or the New York Times, they would say, well, isn't that embassy bombing horrible? Mm -hmm. But it's a long way from home. Exactly. And that was the difference in the tactical shifts like that uh, bin Laden and uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed did with Al Qaeda taking the, the war to the United States. Magnia was smart enough to stay in his area of responsibility and carry out all the carnage he could there. And he did a damn good job of it. Yeah, and that's, that's why I wanted to cover that, because I felt like bin Laden got too ambitious. And yeah, that I think so. Into it. I think so. I think that, uh, you know, uh, certainly I think he was surprised at the success of the Al Qaeda operation. Uh, and, but you know, again, if you if you wind back the clock, Eric, and you look at just the tempo and pace of horrific acts that were happening to us in the '80s in Lebanon, for example, with the uh, U.S. Embassy not being bombed once, but twice. Right. All the hostages that were being kidnapped, all the hijackings that were taking place globally, uh, the assassinations and uh, the kidnappings and the murders. Uh, Magnia was on this reign of terror that was always ahead of us. And we could never get in front of those kinds of problems because our intelligence community the counterterrorism efforts were simply too dysfunctional. Right. And because it was happening overseas, there was never that sense of urgency that we saw unfold after 9-11. Can we go through it all? Because you, you brought it up before. I think you kind of, while things are going on before, I'm, get, um, I'm of the understanding that Black September is sort of the starting of the modern wave. Would that be a good analogy or thought? It would. Uh, you know, I tell uh, analysts and students of terrorism this all the time. If, if you want to understand how we got here, you have to go back and look at an organization called the Black September Organization, which was basically uh, Yasser Arafat's secret terrorist organization, much like the Iranians used Emad Mugnia to mm. blow up the U.S. embassy. So here you had this group, Black September, which is most people know them related to the 1972 Munich massacre mm -hmm. where the 11 Israeli athletes were assassinated. Why that is a pivotal moment, Eric, is because this is the first time that terrorism is really broadcast into the American household. You had everybody tuned in to watch the Olympics in Munich in 72, and all of a sudden you had this horrific terrorist attack, and you had that very infamous picture of the masked terrorist on the balcony that, that just became iconic, kind of defined mm. the moment. And that event changed special event security forever, meaning um, that was the kind of watershed moment that as you fast forward to today, really changed how you protect special events and Olympic athletes and large scale uh, inaugurations and and speeches and so forth. So uh, the Black September organization uh, really um, put uh, their mark on global terror. And they were intertwined with uh, the uh, Red Army faction, with the Italian Red Brigades, um, with the Japanese Red Army. And they were capable of killing and did kill uh, especially Israeli intelligence officers, uh, like we have not seen before. And so for anybody that's watching this, if you really want to see a good uh, film that kind of depicts what took place, look at Steven Spielberg's movie Munich. Mm, and it's okay. very well done. And it really explains uh, how the Black September organization uh, came into its being and how then the Israelis unleashed what was called the Wrath of God squads, how the Israelis decided we are going to go after and hunt down everybody that was involved in Munich, and we're going to kill them. Okay. And so why that's important is because the Israelis really began 
what what we see now, the rendition program, meaning mm. uh, the targeted either kidnapping or assassination. Well, they did it before with Nazi hunters too, right? So they I mean, did. There's a pattern they did. that there, don't, there is don't a mess with them. That, right. There's a pattern there that it's it's kind of like their 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 own national security requirement that they they look at that uh, as um, a tactic that is part of their DNA, part of their uh, operational capabilities to get even, to hunt down these individuals, whether they're Nazis or terrorists, uh, as just part of their, their own internal security apparatus. I would say Old Testament. Yeah, very much so. And, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, That's a... but, but, you know, the, the interesting part is the tactics involved with each really mm. kind of launched a whole counterterrorism kind of innovation, meaning uh, how could you go about infiltrating a group? Meaning how do you locate terrorists? How do you surveil them? Well, it boils down to having human assets mm -hmm. and the ability to get close to people. And the Israelis, uh, when they, they're a very small service, but when they decide to laser fixate on a problem, they really can get the job done. They also and don't so, forget and they have long-term thinking. That's right. That's right. And so when the Israelis decide to go after somebody, they do a good job of it. And related to the Black September organization, you know, I wrote a book um, after my book, Ghost, called Chasing Shadows. Mm -hmm. And that was the story of an Israeli intelligence officer gunned down uh, in Bethesda, Maryland. He was your and neighbor, that was, right? Yes, that, and that was Colonel Joe Alon. Uh, he was a, a, a hero of the Israeli Air Force. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was sent to Washington, D.C. as the Israeli air attache at the time. Uh, and Black September, during this tit-for-tat moment, came into uh, Maryland and assassinated Joe on the front lawn of his house when he pulled into his driveway late at night with his wife. And that was also a pivotal moment in security because before that, Israeli diplomats really were not protected. Uh, they lived out on the economy and in and, and homes and rental residences. So, you know, after that, the Israelis moved all their... Was that pre-Munich or not? I'm just trying to get that the That was post-Munich. Post, post yeah. okay. So in 72, you had the uh, Munich massacre. And then uh, on uh, July 1st, 1973, uh, we're coming up with another anniversary. You know, Colonel Alon was gunned down mm. on the front lawn of his house. And so, you know, that was a case when I was an agent that I tried to revisit uh, in the 80s. But we had so many cold cases during that time period that and we were confronted with so many ongoing terrorist attacks that were just never ending that there wasn't enough time to go back to some of these old cold cases. So I would dabble with it as time permitted. That brings us into another a major terrorist, even though I don't think he was involved with it directly, he just had the intelligence about it. Um, Carlos the Jackal. Yeah, that the Jackal. Um, I, I remember as a young agent, um, we had these uh, accordion folders, Eric, and there was no computers in those days. We had three by five index cards was our database, and you know Motorola pagers and no cell phones. You know most of the people watching this won't remember those days, but <laughs> uh, it, it literally was those kinds of days. And I had this grainy surveillance picture of Carlos the Jackal uh, on my wall, and I had it thumbtacked on my wall. And I don't remember where we got this surveillance picture from. Probably the Israelis, but Lord knows who. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was, of course, just the poster child of terror in those days throughout the 60s and the 70s predominantly before Munich. And so anybody that grew up in that time period knew who he was because he carried out this flamboyant terrorist attack on, on OPEC and took hostages. And, and he was this kind of guy that nobody could find. And it really spoke to the problem when I was there. Eric, that the jackal was this kind of guy that nobody could find, and uh, it wasn't a priority really to find him. Well, he didn't attack Americans. So Correct. He, so he, he was, was another smart one like Magnia, right? Correct. He, he kind of floated on the side, and they attacked the French, and the French were terrible about, you know, they just kind of rolled over all the time. 
they they did and uh but the 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 interesting part about the jackal is and the commonalities with these groups from that time period is they were getting a heck of a lot of support that we found out after the wall fell after the cold war Mm. that that the russian kgb was funding and training and providing material support to all these old leftists, socialists slash communists uh, like the Jackal, because they were again wanted to disrupt the United States. Mm-hmm. Very similar to kind of the election disruptions that we saw last go around, and no doubt we'll see them again in the upcoming election. You know, the Russians believe if they can cause enough chaos, that it's going to totally discombobulate the United States. And that's what they were using people like the Jackal for. So, uh, you know, he was very effective for a long period of time, and it took a long time before, you know, we were able to catch him. Well, you had brought up in your book, and I seem like I'm jumping around, but it it does sort of tie together, the theory of mice. Um, Was it uh, money, ideology, compromise, or ego? Correct. Now, the jackal, from what I have read, was a communist, named after Lenin himself, and really was not that ideological. He was much more in it for cash. Yeah, the Jackal, uh, in my judgment, uh, and I've read everything written about him, and I've communicated with uh, his, um, at, at one point, his wife, uh, Magdalena Kopp. Mm. She recently passed away. Uh, she was a, a notorious uh, terrorist herself, and I was kind of shocked when she agreed to talk to me, Uh, Hmm. but um, the Jackal was very much a mercenary. He was a hired gun, and and he worked for the Soviets. He worked for uh, Muammar Gaddafi and the Libyans. Uh, He worked for the Cuban intelligence service. He worked for the Venezuelans. So, you know, whoever had the highest dollar he would work for, and he was surely motivated by money. Uh, If you look at the, the mice, he just so happened to be that kind of paid hitman that was a very useful tool of the Soviet Union at that time, you know, to help create all this chaos around the globe. He also was motivated a little bit, I think, by his fame. And Robert Ludlum helped him along with the Born Identity, which kind of added to his legend. His name itself was pulled from what Frederick Forsyth's book that was left in the hotel room. Yeah. Uh, Day of the Jackal. Is Which is a great read, by the way. Okay, awesome. Well, any uh, espionage book that you recommend, I think, would be definitely high on the list. Yeah, The Day of the Jackal still resonates today, and it's always on my uh, my reading list as a recommended read for any any student of protection or security. Because you know, I remember there's this famous uh, quote about all all big men have bodyguards that Forsyth talks about in The Day of the Jackal, and we used to have that hanging in our protection office in Washington, D.C., because, uh, you know, it was just one of those kind of uh, books that just kind of set the tone for everybody on how you should try to protect people. Well, and it's, uh, sadly, I'm sure Carlos was studying it himself. Um, Yeah, no doubt. There are tells, and I know that you're in the field, that you've got to watch out for, too. Like, you know who the leader is by the fact that they're to the right all the time or to the left, or I don't remember all that tells, but there are certain factors, or if you just stand back and see who everybody defers to, if you uh, make an event happen, you know, who does everybody look at? There's a lot of espionage tricks like that. Would that be fair? Very fair. Uh, Observation skills. People don't realize how important just basic observation skills are. Uh, to not only stay alive and stay safe, but we, it's really kind of a lost art, Eric. I mean, you see everybody today just walking around, you know, staring into their iPhone, and they're Guilty. they're, they're <laughs> and they're never observant, and uh, so that's just uh, asking for trouble for the most part, either from street crime, and just from an intelligence perspective, you know, if you have a device that can not only be monitored. Uh, but mm-hmm. can be tracked and mapped, and then people just not paying attention. So, you know, early on when we started uh, doing our counter surveillance programs to help protect the likes of the Yester Arafats of the world or Princess Diana mm-hmm. when she came to the United States, 
you know, we would just sit back and watch. And we would be dressed down like you and I are today. Mm -hmm. And we would be outside of that traditional protection bubble that, you know, you got the the, the good looking agents with the earpieces and the Ray Bans. Mm -hmm. And we were on the perimeter just looking for those threats before they could get in. So uh, that's one of the things that I learned in the course of my career that, you know, you have to be looking for that kind of activity before it turns operational, meaning you learn quickly as an agent in the protection business that your kill zone is like three to seven feet. Mm. And basically most agents are in a diamond or in a bubble around a protectee. Mm -hmm. They're looking for hands. They're looking for demeanor. But you very rarely look outside of that three to seven foot kind of little bubble that you're in. So the whole premise of our counter surveillance program that we developed centered on being on the outside, looking for threats before they got on the inside. And so it's it's a very effective program to protect high value targets, uh, buildings, people, CEOs today, heads of state or threatened personalities. And it's also the kind of protection that can be unfolded and it's not visible. So, mm -hmm. for example, there's a whole range of people that really don't want a visible security bubble around them. Sure. But they want to know that they're safe. And so that counter surveillance model is one that you, that works very well with those kinds of personalities. It's also a tremendous uh, program to use for children, you know, children mm -hmm. of high net worth, you know, children of of celebrities and so forth that uh, want to go about a normal life, uh, but their parents are still very, very much worried about kidnapping or, or threats. Sure. Now, you you speak about being low profile. Your agency was so low profile that I had never heard of it, and most people hadn't. Can you tell us about the DSS? I, I sure can. Uh, if you look at, that's not surprising. Uh, you know, I, that's why, you know, before we were, we went on the air here, I, I would tell people that I was a, a State Department special agent. Oh, okay, then I get it. Uh, most people have never heard of the Diplomatic Security Service. That's getting better. But the organization has been around since 1916. Mm -hmm. And it was first called uh, the Office of Security for the State Department. And they had a chief special agent. And so, uh, in, in those days, we were looking at uh, subversives and sabotage and, and spies going back to the First World War. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, you hearken into the World War II. But one of the problems that uh, the State Department has had historically is we have to protect all the diplomats abroad. Mm -hmm. So uh, they have special agents that are in every consulate and embassy in the world today. And that's called the Diplomatic Security Service. They also provide uh, the diplomatic couriers, meaning, you know, your traditional uh, briefcase, uh, you know, with the uh, handcuff to your to your wrist. Uh, no, they're not uh, important. No, no. I, I was looking for up. mine here. I still have mine here somewhere, but now I can't find it. Uh, it's not handcuffed to my wrist. Uh, but uh, you know, they provide a safeguard of equipment going to embassies to make sure that the Russians or the Cubans aren't going to put any listening devices in them, you know, and those used to be pretty cool jobs. You know, if you want to see the world become a diplomatic courier, that's under the diplomatic security service. And the DSS also does passport and visa fraud investigations. Uh, they do protective intelligence investigations, which was part of the program that, that I started and ran. Uh, they manage the Rewards for Justice program, uh, the $20 million program for bin Laden, and the program that was used to hunt down Saddam Hussein. Mm -hmm. You know, and I used the program to hunt down Ramzi Yosef, the mastermind of the First World Trade Center bombing. Yeah, you actually personally handled a million and a half dollars in a suit or in a briefcase, right? Eric, I, I've gotten much, much more credit for that than I deserve. Uh, but you know, I, the money still staggering to have that much money in possession. It, it, it's feel crazy. It, it was somewhat crazy, but uh, it's not your money. It's the taxpayer's money. Uh, <laughs> and it, 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 you'd be surprised. You know, I think it was a, 
you know, it, it all fit in a GSA black briefcase. Uh, you know, the, the funny part of that really was um, when we would pay those reward amounts, we would have to tell the recipient that they had to report that as income to the IRS. <laughs> <laughs> And you would get these crazy stares, like, "Okay, sure." And I, and uh, you know, I we would have to make them sign a form that they were going to report it to the IRS. And some of these people, you're never going to see them again, right? Oh, and and so uh, you know, but that was just one of the the absurdities of that program. But what most people also don't realize about the DSS, Eric, is that uh, we protect a heck of a lot of people that visit the United States. You know. Uh, the Princess Dianas of the world, uh, mm. uh, you know, those kinds of people. We manage large-scale special events like the Olympics, uh, the United Nations General Assemblies. And we work hand-in-glove with our other federal partners. The U.S. Secret Service is a big well, partner. I wanted to go. I, I'm confused. And I, I will admit that I'm very grumpy about all the agencies out there. Like I, I understand. I, and, and, you know, I could be wrong, and please set me straight, but I always want to be honest. I feel like why do we have a Secret Service, a DSS, a CIA? A, you know, why do we have all these three-letter agencies when some of the missions seem to overlap so much that wouldn't the wouldn't it make more sense for them to be part of the same agency that would be sharing information within itself? Well, uh, I I understand. I've heard that a lot over the years. Uh, but do you really want a global single police force? You know, some would argue that the FBI has become that today. You know, they, they've got their hands in everything from counterintelligence to counterterrorism to, uh, you know, weapons of mass destruction to you name it. The FBI has got their hand in it and they're global. Uh, now, you know, some would say that maybe they've got too much authority. But when you look at the breakdown of these different agencies, each one has very unique statutory authority. You know, for the State Department, DSS, it's for the protection of of official Americans overseas, for passport and visa fraud investigations, for threat investigations, for protective intelligence investigations, for the protection of individuals that are not heads of state. And so the Secret Service has protection of the president, the vice president, all former presidents, but they also have visiting heads of state. How about the, the uh, state, Speaker of the House? The Speaker of the House is protected by the U.S. Capitol Police. Okay, see where I go crazy. Yes, I, I understand. <laughs> I understand. Uh, and, you know, the ATF has gun investigations and explosives right. investigations. So each agency has their own little bailiwick. But in today's terrorism world, most of them do work together in fusion centers and under, under the DHS. Mm -hmm or under the Joint Terrorism Task Force that the FBI has. So, you know, it's not unusual today to see all these agencies working together, hand in glove, to solve a unique problem. Now, you did mention before, and I, I watched interviews with you too, in addition to the reading. Um, I believe in one of these lectures, you were answering questions, and you mentioned that one of the problems we have, though, is there are no first-generation Somalis in the FBI, I think was an example that you used, or Sudanese or somebody like that. And the reason was that they couldn't vet them to give them a clearance. So then we're losing the talent of people who could be absolutely patriotic, but they can't be cleared to actually do the intelligence. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. If you look at, uh, well, when I joined uh, the State Department Diplomatic Security Service, you know, most of the agents, uh, we had very few women. Uh, we had very few uh, African-Americans. Uh, I think in my basic agent class, uh, there were two uh, African-American agents, maybe just one, if memory serves me right. I'm going back a few years now. Mm -hmm. And so you had, you had an organization like ours that was uh, everybody looked like me. And right. you're not going to be infiltrating uh, Hezbollah or Al-Qaeda looking like me. And so if you look at uh, part of the counterterrorism problems that are confronting our country today, you take a melting pot like New York City, and the mm -hmm. New York City Intelligence Division of the NYPD has done a good job of bringing in various uh, 
uh, ethnic groups and minorities to work different problems. And that's how, when you start looking at uh, our counterterrorism problems across the country, why the FBI has taken some local and state police officers in under their joint terrorism mm. task force capacity, because organizations have reached out and hired local cops that are representative of the communities that they live and work and have grown up in. And the U.S. government clearance process is really very old school, kind of Cold War fixated on, I've got to investigate Fred Burton's uh, parents just right. in case he w they were Soviet spies. They weren't. You know, my dad was a coal miner from West Virginia. But my point is, is that sure. uh, people, they, they go back that far and they look and it becomes very, very problematic to try to investigate a first generation American that might have immigrated here uh, from Somalia or the Sudan or Lebanon. So that's part of the challenge when it comes to just hiring good people. So um, this is one of the things that I think the FBI understands and they mm -hmm. recognize and other agencies are trying to deal with this as well. Okay, well, I, that's good. So the, things are improving from yes. what you're saying. I think that was a 10-year-old interview. So maybe that is um, stuff as we move along <laughs> or they're getting desperate enough to try it. Well, I think that, you know, for the most part, I think the, you know, the federal law enforcement has to be representative of our nation as a whole. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's critical that we look into, uh, you know, having the best qualified applicants from all the different uh, organizations and representatives from um, all the different uh, ethnic groups uh, in general, because we need their help. It, it makes organizations much more stronger. Uh, it makes them uh, much more uh, inclusive and can be used in the communities to, to foster better relations mm -hmm. uh, and to try to break down some of the barriers that, you know, these horrific problems that we're starting to see unfold across our great nation today, you know, just, you know, in the law enforcement community. Yeah, we have some definite internal issues, too. And I kind of wonder if in the 90s, things like the World Trade Center may have gotten downplayed because we had an Oklahoma City. Yes, and Waco. Remember and Waco. that. Uh, and Ruby Ridge. Yeah, we, and Ruby Ridge. And, uh, you know, the list goes on. Uh, you know, I, I, I have said this before. Others might disagree. But I lived through this time period, Eric. You know, the assassination of Rabbi Meir Kahani of the Jewish Defense League in New York City, um, which was before the first World Trade Center bombing in 93, mm -hmm. uh, was really the first strike on U.S. soil by al-Qaeda. And an Egyptian national by the name of El Sayed Nasser uh, gunned down Rabbi Meir Kahani uh, after a speaking event in New York City. And, you know, that weapon was traced, I traced that weapon to the Egyptian army. Mm. And I remember sitting back thinking, how in the hell did a gun that the U.S. sold to the Egyptian army ends up in a political murder in the streets of New York City? And mm. then as you start to look into Nocer, um, that investigation really started to unfold after the first World Trade Center bombing. And you saw we had this nest of individuals that were here to put together the first World Trade Center plot, the killing of Rabbi Marikahani. And then they also had this, oh my gosh, you know, uh, horrendous hit list of attacks at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, you know, efforts to try to assassinate President Mubarak of Egypt when he visited the United States, uh, plans to try to shoot down the presidential helicopter, uh, let's, plans to blow up the Brooklyn Bridge. You know, and you sit back and you think, well, you know, maybe those plans are a little bit grandiose, but not really. This was an organization that blew up the World Trade Center the first time. Uh, and then they came back and blew it up the second time. So, you know, um, we just did not have, have the resources in the first Trade Center attack to prevent it. Uh, and we did not have the sources, you know, inside these organizations to try to thwart some of these attacks from taking place. You know, it's funny you mentioned that. I had heard somewhere talking about there's we're under violence lately. 
with the um, rioting and I don't believe it's the protesters. I believe it's infiltrators who are taking advantage of a situation and Black Lives Matter. So, you know, agitators who are, you know, in the midst of it. But it doesn't take much but a couple people to tear up an entire downtown in a relatively short time. I mean, they can smash a window, go in, throw stuff around, set a fire, move on to the next place. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, uh, you look at the complexity of... Uh... Not only the 9-11 operation, multiple planes, suicide pilots. Right. Look at the complexity of the 93 attack, a very sophisticated bomb, uh, much like we saw in Oklahoma City, uh, mm. where many of us were convinced was Hezbollah at the time before mm. Timothy McVeigh was captured. Yeah, just the scope and the modeling from some of the, the way the building collapsed. I mean, for those of you who are watching this, just Google the Oklahoma City bombing, and look at just the structural damage to the federal building there. it And put it next to the U.S. Embassy bombing from uh, Beirut in 83 or 84. And you put them side by side, Eric, and they look identical. And hmm. so when we saw that, you know, the first few hours, we said, this has to be foreign terrorism. And I know for many hours, we suspected Hezbollah was behind that attack because of the structural damage and just the sheer size of that bomb. And that takes a lot of work. But you look at what you talked about, the ease of just using your vehicle to kill people, meaning mm -hmm. you don't have to go out and buy and make a bomb, use your car. You know, why go out and try to acquire a, a pistol or a, uh, a, an automatic weapon when a, your old car or a truck will do? Mm -hmm. So... You know, those are the challenges. But, you know, to me, as I look back on my career here related to this time period, Eric, is th there's two key points that constantly surfaced. And one was a lack of human, a lack of human intelligence, meaning we did not have sources inside these organizations to tell us what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And the second failure point was a lack of tactical analysis, meaning after all these attacks, we always found needles buried in the haystack, those warnings and indicators that something was coming. So if you break it down, our ability to find those needles now in the haystack are so much better, but every successful attack and every successful attack going forward, you will find those two components. You will find that we lack human intelligence and we lack the tactical analysis to find those needles in a haystack. Would it be fair to say we might lack the imagination? And, and I, I don't know if that would fall under tactical analysis or not, but, you know, the whole thing of, wow, they were flying a lot of planes but never wanted to land them. There's a leap of imagination to say, huh, that's weird. What could they be doing? I mean, it's not a natural thing that we would, you know, think of. Right. I think, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, that was one of the 9-11 Commission's uh, findings, that there was a failure of imagination. Mm -hmm. uh, I think most of us that, that worked down in the weeds knew that these groups were capable of surveilling the Waldorf Astoria, surveilling the Brooklyn Bridge, um, and that they were fully capable of doing these kinds of attacks. The, the problem rested with our inability to have someone close enough inside to infiltrate this organization to know what was going on. It's kind of like, you know, before we started chatting for your video and your podcast, you know, in order to understand what we talked about, you got to have source coverage of that conversation. Sure. Through technical means, through one of us as an informant mm -hmm. to say, Eric said this. And so, that at times is what we always lacked. Right. And that is so hard to find people that you can double that can work those kinds of cases for you. That's that's always been kind of our Achilles heel, the difficulty of, of getting close to these terrorist groups is we've just lacked that placement of human sources in these organizations. We use Israel quite a lot for that, right? Well, we use our Five Eyes partners. You know, mm -hmm. we use the Brits. Uh, you know, they're very good at human intelligence collection. The Israelis are are very, very good at certain target sets, namely Iran, Hezbollah, Palestinians, 
the Jordanians are uh, some of the best in the region when it comes to just monitoring uh, subversive groups and terrorist organizations. Hmm. And then, you know, the Saudis have picked up their game. So we rely heavily, heavily on liaison networks with our foreign counterparts. And, and that's what a lot of Americans don't understand, that as big as the U.S. intelligence community is, and it's pretty big, hmm. that at the end of the day, we still rely heavily on foreign intelligence to get in front of these threats. Well, and part of that too is because we, we love our um, technology and a lot of the people we're fighting against, well, they're, they have millennial thinking as in they've been doing this for millennium and they can hand a message to one another. They don't necessarily have to use a cell phone. They have old family connections and that that's very hard to infiltrate too, right? If they're really tight lipped, they're like, I either grew up with you, I knew you, I knew your sister, whatever. How do you get into that kind of a group? And we also don't control the geography, meaning True. that's that's huge. I mean, if you look at the success of, let's give the FBI some shout outs. If you look at the success of the FBI of breaking organized crimes back, mm -hmm. it, it's because you know it happened in areas that we control the geography, New York City, let's use as an example, uh, where you do have the ability to get in with human sources, technology, wiretaps, to go about uh, piecing together the problem. When we're relying on trying to infiltrate you know, groups like Hezbollah or Al-Qaeda, uh, we don't own that geography. Mm. So we are greatly reliant on our foreign intelligence partners to help us. That, that, that makes total sense. Now I'm gonna jump ahead to the, I guess, well, most common name, Osama bin Laden. And it was interesting, you know, watching you in, I think, 2009 in a lecture, you had thought he might already be dead. You're connected, and maybe you can answer a question for me. Why are there no pictures of him after death? We're very happy to have um, Saddam Hussein and, you know, his kids shown and everything else. But bin Laden, honestly, there doesn't seem to be much proof of anything. Well, uh, I think that the reason that uh, a decision was made not to produce photographs of bin Laden was predicated upon some strategic decision points. Now, I've had the honor of seeing uh, Admiral Bill McRaven speak a couple of times uh, at, at events talking about uh, the bin Laden raid. And I've also had the opportunity to talk with a few folks that were deployed on that mission. Mm -hmm. And remember, you know, you're following guidance given to you from the National Security Council or the White House at, at those moments in time. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you look back, and I, I certainly was not in a position to be part of that decision matrix, those are decided. Um, I, had, I had been long out of the government at that point in time. But I could see how they could make that decision because, you know, you had such a charismatic leader of mm -hmm. an organization that, and there was such fear of what could happen next, the blowback, that I think that um, in retrospect, it was probably the right decision to make. Really? Because, um, you know, if I had to be asked at that time, what's the best thing to do? I probably would have decided that myself uh, if I was in a position or someone asked, because I think what you don't want to do, Eric, is give these groups, especially like Al Qaeda, uh, the opportunity, you know, to utilize that kind of footage or pictures forever, you know. And and we've seen that in, yeah, the martyrdom. We've seen that historically, and so, you know, from from that perspective, I I think that was the right call. And you know, who am I to second guess, you know, decision making, uh, mm -hmm. you know leaders at that moment in time. And, you know, I, I certainly have the utmost respect for Admiral McRaven, um, you know, and the efforts that um, the team undertook. But, you know, again, uh, you know, my hat's off to the CIA and uh, for finding him. You know, you had a whole long list of analysts that had worked very quietly behind the scenes, you know, because that was hard work uh, to try to piece together exactly where he was. Well, that's 
good to hear and it's definitely something to think of because I thought of it in terms of like they put Saddam's boys up so people would say, okay, yeah, they are dead. Dead is true. It's not a lie because there was so much misinformation going on all the time that, oh, no, they're not really dead. You know, America's lying. They always lie, blah, blah, blah. So I didn't know if it wouldn't have been a good idea just to say, hey, uh, no, he, he is dead. I think, uh, I, I think there's certain incidents over the course of history that, um, you know, sometimes, um, you know, and, and I'm a big believer in transparency when it comes to sure. issues like this. But, you know, in reality, if you look at that, you know, you can never recreate these moments of time, Eric, that when some of these decisions are made. And, you know, it's it's very difficult to think about that. Meaning, sure. you know, here we are now looking back on that event and saying, OK, if we release that photograph now or photographs now, would it be a big deal? Very well might. But my point is, is that for whatever point in time that moment and that decision was made, um, they the, the National Security Council deemed that it was the right call to make at that time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think it's very difficult to step back and, and look at those. You know, it's. It's kind of like I'll use my my chasing shadows analogy. You know, my uh, the murder of Colonel Alon in 1973. You know, you look at that case today and you say, "Well, that case is solvable." Well, it sure is today, right? But it DNA wasn't solvable. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't solvable in 1973. I mean, you did not have DNA. You did not have. Um, forensic technology. You did not have crime scene text. And so people are, you know, you didn't have CSI, you know, you didn't have these vans that rolled up and, and locked down the crime scene right. and looked for trace evidence. And so I think it's important when you look at some of these old cases like that, you know, that, that you have to put yourself in that time frame, not only forensically, but from an intelligence perspective, and also from a foreign policy perspective and and think you know who would we who would we potentially have harmed by doing that and what would have been the blowback right. to five eyes or to our foreign intelligence partners well on that note because there's so much to talk to you about and we need to wrap up on this one i have a live stream where i bring up Pre previous guests to answer my questions, my audience questions, and their own audience questions. I was wondering if you might enjoy or entertain the idea of coming back for a live stream where people could ask you questions directly. Love to. Be happy to. Bring them on. Okay, fantastic. And for now, people can find you at strat4.com? Yes, and they can also find me at um, officialfredburton.com, official Fred which is my website, too. Yes, and buy his books. <laughs> well, thank you. I would love that by well, all means. And I can tell you right now, Ghost is excellent book. Um, thank it's, you. It's a real life book, but it reads like a spy thriller. It's really, really cool. And I appreciate you coming on so much. Eric, thank you so much for having me. You're very kind to have me on.